Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Russ Harrison, Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA in Washington, DC. This is the IEEE USA March 19th, 2021 legislative update. Get things started off right. Wish a happy birthday to William Jennings Bryant. Uh, I believe he is the man, the man who has run the most times for United States president as a serious candidate. Uh, Bryant ran in 1896 against uh, William McKinley, 1900 and 1908. Came closest in 19, excuse me, 1896, the first time through uh, when he lost by about eh, 600,000 ish votes. Um, so wish him happy birthday. Uh, before we get into the heart of our, our update, we have some exciting good news from just this morning. Uh, former Senator Bill Nelson has been named uh, President Biden's first NASA administrator. Um, kind of an unusual choice, um, but an excellent one from a policy standpoint. Uh, uh, Bill Nelson was Senator, Democratic Senator from Florida from 2000 to 2018. He was, in fact, an astronaut while he was in the House of Representatives before going to the Senate uh, in, in 1986. Uh, he actually was the first elected member of Congress to go into space and he was on the very last space shuttle mission before the Challenger disaster. So he knows NASA, he's a big supporter of space, uh, he understands the space policy world, uh, and will certainly be a seasoned uh, Washington hand uh, representing NASA uh, in the Biden administration, all of which is quite exciting. Uh, it is a little peculiar, um, Senator, well, now Administrator Nelson, or soon to be Administrator Nelson, uh, is towards the end of his career. Uh, and it is a little surprising that uh, President Biden picked um, a veteran Washington person like uh, uh, Senator Nelson for this position. But from my triple USA's perspective, it's fantastic because he'll be a great leader uh, and a great advocate for NASA and for space uh, in Washington. So good news to start things off today. Uh, next, we want to move to a quick uh, discussion of earmarks. Wait, that's not right. Earmarks are banned in Washington. Instead, we're going to talk about community project funding requests, which are exactly like earmarks, but we've been told by congressional leaders they're not the same. So no earmarks, community project funding. Uh, these are funding for specific projects put into the federal budget. So the federal budget will say, you know, Department of, of Transportation will build, will, you know, spend $10 million or whatever building or interchange at this location on this highway. Uh, and so it's a specific budget request in the, well, not budget request, it's specific budget line item um, that used to be called an earmark, but is now called a community project fund. Um, there's some interesting quirks to how this is being done. First of all, these are just House rules. The Senate are still banning these. Uh, but in the House, individual representatives will be limited to 10 requests. That's not very many. Uh, typical congressional office could have done 20 or 30 of these back in the day when earmarks were more common. Um, but now they're going to be limited to 10 apiece. And the 10 requests have to be ranked. Um, that's important politically. Moreover, legislators have to include in their 10 requests specific project funds. Uh, excuse me, program funds. And what I mean by that is if a congressman wants to ask that NIST's budget be increased by a billion dollars, that has to be one of his or her 10 requests, along with, you know, money for a new bridge or a new school or whatever it is that, or a new fire station or whatever. Now, what are the consequences of this? Well, ranking the projects allows legislators to tell appropriators what they really want funded and what they just want to look like they want funded. 435 members of the House of Representatives plus the shadow delegates from the, uh, the, the territories, if each one of them submits just 10 requests, that's an awful lot of requests, <clears throat> which means they're not all going to get them. If you give a legislator, and this is just a rule of thumb whenever you're meeting with a legislator, when you give a legislator a list of five or six things that you want from them, they are going to pick the easiest thing on the list and then do that. Uh, then they've done something to help you. They did what you asked and they don't have to work very hard. Uh, by ranking them, 
The legislators are telling the appropriators what they want the appropriators to focus on and what they don't want their appropriators to focus on. Since the appropriators can't give everything to everybody, they will pick one or two things from per, you know each person uh, to do for them. And they're going to start at the top and work their way down. And what this means is when a legislator makes a request that he or she really wants, it goes at one or two. When it's something that's just kind of helping out a constituent that they don't really care all that much about, it'll be, you know, eight, nine, 10. And then the legislator will be able to say, look, I helped you. I tried to help you without wasting one of his top draft picks, so to speak. But here's the complicating factor. Program funding requests, that's requesting for budget levels for entire pieces of the government, don't have the same political weight as a community funding project. When a legislator can get money for a specific project in a district, that equals votes because you can go back to the voters and say, see that thing over there? See that park over there? I got the money for that. When you go to enjoy the park, thank me. When you're funding, say, you know, increasing uh, research funding at the National Science Foundation, there's nothing to point to. Our concern is that by producing this ranked system, the program budget levels will be moved to the bottom of the list because they're less politically important, which means it's going to be harder to generate political support for the budgets that we are most interested in which means most of our project will going to be shifting, I shouldn't say most of, shifting the focus for our advocacy efforts on the budget to the Senate where these rules don't apply. So last time we talked a little bit about the state digital privacy laws, and I, I said we we're going to go into a little more detail on them today, which we will. But first we want to just set the stage by reminding everyone what federalism means in this context. A federal system of government distributes political power across the various levels of government. So the federal government is in charge of some things and not in charge of other things. States are in charge of some things. Local governments are in charge of some things. And by distributing political power like that, each one of the states, and to a lesser extent local communities, becomes a laboratory for democracy, at least in theory. The idea is, if the country is confronting a problem, each state can develop their own solution to that problem. Some states will work, some states won't. We'll all learn from, well, both states and be able to develop a national policy that works at best for everyone instead of the federal government just picking one policy and implementing that policy and hoping for the best. So this is the system and it actually works pretty well. And if you look across American history, we, we, it's one of the reasons our system is so adaptive is because we can do this experimentation in the states but it doesn't always work. And digital privacy is probably one of those areas. So what is the current state of the laws? Right now, Maine, California, Nevada, and Virginia all have digital privacy laws on the books. Those are in the order that they were passed. There are a couple other states that have similar laws that depending on how you define things could count, but those are the four big ones so far. Uh, at the moment, most state legislatures are in session and there are a bunch of digital privacy laws working their way through state legislatures. Washington and Oklahoma both have digital privacy laws that have passed one house of their state house. Alabama, Arizona, Kentucky, Florida, Illinois, Minnesota, and New York all have legislation in committees. Uh, Mississippi, North Dakota, and Utah have already voted their uh, digital privacy laws down, but they're at least looking at the issue. So we have a lot of states looking at this, a lot of pieces of legislation moving around. Um, which tells us, you know, we, we have experimentation going on, which is exciting. I'm not going to go into huge detail on each one of the laws because that would take a long time, but very quickly, uh, the main law was the first and it's the smallest. Uh, it deals only with uh, internet service providers in the broadband space that operate in Maine um, and only ha has a, a somewhat limited, um, a limited impact on them. Um, it um, requires the ISPs to get permission from consumers before using, that is selling, buying, analyzing, trading, giving personal information, which is fairly broadly defined. Um, they need affirmative consent, which means people have to actually say that you can use it as opposed to failing to say you can't use it. 
Um, and it only applies to broadband providers in Maine. So it, it doesn't actually apply to all that many companies, but it does apply to a number of companies. Uh, Nevada's law, individuals may request that their data not be sold or used. Note that the burden is on the individual. The company doesn't have to get permission. They just have to not be prohibited. Um, and customers have to be notified that their information is collected. Uh, the Virginia law, which just became law recently, individuals have the right to see, correct, delete personal information, which is more narrowly defined than it is in Maine. Uh, and individuals may opt out of collective efforts. Um, the big bill, however, is California, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is big both because the law itself is, is much broader than most of the other states and because it's California, that's where the tech companies are, and of course, that's where a lot of people are. So California just counts more than Maine and Nevada and Virginia. Um, so consumers have a right to know what information is being collected and how it will be used and or transferred. They have a right to access their information and may have it deleted usually. Uh, that doesn't apply to publicly available data. So for example, your criminal record, can't delete that. Um, there's very tight restrictions on children's data. Uh, the definition of covered information is broader than most of the other states. It includes personal identifiers, which is a phrase used in most state laws, but it means different things in each state. Uh, in California's case, it means any information that can be used to identify someone. So it's not just your name and address. It's also information that would allow someone to figure out who you are. Um, applies to most companies that operate, uh, uh, most ISPs, most internet service providers, uh, and contains a limited private right of action. And this is a big contentious issue in this field. The idea is if a company misuses your data, what happens? Now, currently in Nevada, Maine, and Virginia, the state attorney general can file suit and you know fine a company for misusing people's data. But in California, in certain cases, individuals can privately sue the companies for misusing their data, which of course makes it much, much more expensive. So these are the bills. There's a, a, a number of ways, they're, they're all kind of similar. They all look at most more or less the same issues, but there are some significant differences in the definition of personal information, as I already mentioned. The issue if, if it's an opt out or an opt in state, do people have to ask you to not have their data collected, or do you have to ask them to allow you to collect their data? Uh, the consequences for abuse, the fines, uh, the penalties, the private right of action issue, uh, and the consequences for failing to protect data very widely. How much do companies have to do to protect their data? At what point does a data breach become a criminal, criminally punishable act? And this, part of punishing the company that was supposed to protect the data. Now, these it, it, in, in legal terms, these differences are not enormous, but they are differences. And given the realities of cyberspace, it is increasingly difficult for companies, will become increasingly difficult for companies to operate in multiple states with multiple similar, but not the same laws. Complying with these different laws is becoming difficult and will become more difficult over time and become more expensive. Now, I don't think this is that big a deal to the big tech companies, Google and Facebook and all those folks. They have the resources, they have the personnel, they have the technology, and they have the money to comply with all these laws. They would probably rather not, but they can. But I think there is a real problem for the smaller companies and startups, companies that don't have a huge IT infrastructure, that don't have armies of technology people, that don't have armies of lawyers, and can't afford millions of dollars in, in compliance costs. What these digital privacy laws do, in effect, is create a barrier to entry to any internet companies that want to take on the entrenched incumbents. And over time, I think that's going to be a problem. IEEE-USA is working with Congress, we're working with legislators to help craft a national law. Cyberspace is national, and while federalism is important and is a good idea in this particular case, we think we need a national law that make everybody the same to allow all the companies to operate online all across the country. 
Different note, <clears throat> we've talked about the PRO Act a couple times. This is the, uh, it's the union organizing bill that also includes the ABC test for uh, identifying independent consultants. Uh, the bill passed the House of Representatives on almost exactly party line votes uh, a week or so ago. There were no amendments and in fact, no real discussion of the ABC test. Um, as written, <clears throat> the PRO Act represents a very serious threat to independent contractors in the technology space. Depending on how the law is ultimately enforced, it could make it extremely difficult for most independent consultants in, I, in IEEE to continue to be independent inside the United States. The bill now moves to the Senate. We're hoping that there'll be a more lively debate uh, in the Senate. The House really didn't debate the bill very much. Uh, it was introduced and it just passed, uh, which is kind of unfortunate for a bill of this scope. Um, key legislators in the Senate, Senators Murray, Burr, Hickenlooper, and Braun, the chairs and ranking minority members uh, of the committee that has jurisdiction, uh, the HELP committee. Um, we are reaching out to their staff to express our concerns. Uh, any IEEE members, particularly consultants in Washington, North Carolina, Colorado, and Indiana, uh, who would like to talk about this with the purpose of perhaps getting in touch with your senators to talk about the bill, uh, please contact me after the presentation. So <clears throat> rumor has it uh, that the next, now that the COVID relief bill has passed, the next big bill that Congress wants to look at it's being discussed as a China bill, which is interesting. Um, the idea is this is a bill that is designed to help the United States respond to the rising threat of China. It would include provisions to boost America's competitiveness, probably the Endless Frontier Act or a version of it, possibly the CHIPS Act, possibly language promoting uh, 5G, 6G, and other advanced technolo communication technologies. The bill is currently being drafted by Senator Schumer, who you will recall is the primary champion of the Endless Frontier Act, uh, which is why I suspect it will be in there. Um, the plan, according to Senator Schumer, is to vote on this bill and to vote it through Congress in April. That means that the infrastructure bill that legislators were starting to work on will be bumped to May. Um, that's all tentative. This is an interesting way of viewing these um, economic development bills that we've been working on. Um, China was always part of the discussion, although generally it wasn't a public part of the discussion, uh, but it narrows the focus and purpose of the bill, although that doesn't mean it'll narrow kind of the text of the bill and what the bill actually does. Um, but it's a very provocative position to take, uh, to say we're going to pass, you know, a several hundred billion dollar piece of legislation for the purpose of combating China. Um, Senator Schumer hopes to have the bill out in a week or so. Uh, so hopefully by our next update, I'll be able to tell you what the details are. We're very excited about it. Endless Frontier Act, you will recall, would give $100 billion over 10 years, excuse me, over five years uh, to do tech research, uh, which would be a big deal to IEEE members in all corners of the Institute. Few other quick little updates. Um, you may recall a year or so ago, we talked at length about the new FCC rules on robocalls and how the FCC dramatically changed its core principles really on telephones uh, to allow uh, for a crackdown on fraudulent robocalls. Uh, they are now getting serious. Uh, just last week, the FCC issued the largest fine ever for fraudulent robocalls, $225 million against a company that was selling fraudulent healthcare products. A bunch of technology hearings in Congress uh, this week next. Um, there'll be a couple on solar winds and the big uh, uh, government hacks that have happened, the data breaches that we've seen in the last couple of months. Uh, there are a couple hearings, a couple co uh, committees are looking at uh, technology monopolies. Interestingly, the two parties define that term fairly differently, which is legally a problem. Uh, but both parties are interested in the conversation, at least. Uh, there's going to be a hearing on the game-like investment apps. This is the Reddit um, and the, the um, GameStop 
stock manipulation that happened a couple weeks ago uh, that Congress may or may not be concerned about. Uh, and there's going to be a, a hearing on a review of Section 230, the Technology Shield. That is the law that says that people that maintain online platforms are not responsible for content placed on those platforms um, if all they're doing is providing a venue for people to talk. Uh, the particular review of Section 230 is, is looking at whether or not certain websites are empowering pedophiles and child predators by not censoring and limiting speech on their sites. Uh, again, it's interesting, the two parties take a fairly dramatically different approach to this, um, but both parties are questioning whether Section 230, uh, yeah, 230 should be reined in and narrowed. Uh, we expect the American Innovation Act to be reintroduced next year. Uh, this was a bill that sets the United States on a, uh, a path for spending five for five percent real growth in spending on R and D. That's five percent plus the inflation rate. Inflation's running about two percent, so it's, it'd be a seven percent increase for a five percent real increase. Sets the major federal research uh, agencies, including all the ones we care about, NSF, uh, Department of Ager, Energy, Office of Science, um, and NIST, um, on this path for annual increases of 5% real growth for the next 10 years, which is exciting. And in other news, uh, Senator Durbin, who is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and therefore has authority over immigration legislation, has said that he sees little chance of the large immigration bill passing uh, Senate at the Senate as written. The House passed a couple immigration bills uh, today and yesterday, um, but the Senate, specifically Senator Durbin, uh, has not indicated he was terribly excited about them. So we will see what happens next on that. This is what we expected, by the way. Uh, a lot of legislators are expect, expressing skepticism about the big immigration bills. But little ones might be able to move once the big ones get out of the way. Quick update on our Congressional Virtual Visits Day, which is scheduled for April 14th. We currently have 173 registrants, which is just over 100 more than our previous high. Um, these registrants come from 39 states and 127 individual congressional districts, meaning we are currently planning on meeting with just under half of Congress on April 14th, which is amazing. Uh, registration has formally closed for the CVVD. However, if any of you would like to join us, please send me an email. I need your name, your cell phone, and your home address. And we need the home address so that we can verify which congressional district you're in. The legislators ask before they'll give us a meeting. Uh, and we need the cell phone just so we can communicate with you on the 14th should something happen. These meetings are constantly moving around. Um, we're working with Soapbox, Soapbox Consulting to set up all these meetings. We already have 45 set, eight of which are with the legislators themselves, which is a very good percentage for this early in the process. Uh, the first training for this year's CVD will be at three o'clock today, so in about an hour and a half. And the link to watch that, that training is on your screen. After we complete the training, it will be recorded and will be posted on the IEEE USA website if anybody would like to see it. Our next update will be April 2nd. That's the beginning of their Easter, uh, Congress's Easter recess. Uh, and so we that is also the beginning of budget season. We will expect to almost have the president's budget proposal out by then. Uh, so we should be able to start talking about the 2021 appropriate or the 2022 appropriations process. And before we go to your questions, which if you have any questions, please put them into your chat and I'll respond to them in a moment. But I'm Russ Harrison, Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA in Washington, D.C. My phone number is 202-530-8326. My email address is r.t for thomas .harrison at IEEE.org. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. There we go. Um, Brendan Godfrey asks, under California law, can a company refuse service to individuals who do not opt in? Maybe. 
technically they're not allowed to do that. However, if the company, well, first of all, in some cases, if you don't opt in, there is no service and you, you know, you doesn't, their product doesn't work. And obviously the company does not have to provide you with a service that they can't give you. You know, you think of Google Maps, for example, if you don't let Google, if you don't leave your phone, tell Google Maps where you are, Google Maps can't tell you how to get where you're going. So if the service requires you to opt in, then they can, you know, not give the, give you the service if you don't opt in. Now that seems very clear, but it's really not. And so the, the, the real world implication of the rule that they can't deny you a service unless they can't deliver the service is companies will have a certain amount of discretion to deny people services if they fail to opt in uh, to the data sharing plan that the company has put together. Uh, is there a status on the Improving Digital ID Act that was mentioned in the updates a few weeks ago? Uh, Mr. Burke, thank you for paying attention. And the answer is no, not much has happened to it. Um, I believe there was a hearing on it a week or so ago. Um, but as far as I know, it has not moved. I will make a note to give you a, a more comprehensive update uh, next time. Uh, Brandon Godfrey asks uh, about spoofing. Uh, and if Congress is going to pass uh, regulations uh, to ban the spoofing of phone numbers, uh, this is something that's come up before. Um, and I, I think your impression is right. Uh, I can tell you I get phone calls every day from all over the country, and they're all about my car warranty. And I'm pretty sure they're not coming from all over the country. Um, this seems to me to be a fairly easy fix. I mean, if you're going to call someone, you have to be honest about who you are. That doesn't seem like a terribly onerous thing to require people do to me. But the way this stands now, the as I mentioned, the FCC has passed some fairly good and strict regulations on robocalls. Um, but it takes a while for these things to be put in place and to start working. Congress is waiting to see what happens with the FCC's regulations, as, as is the FCC, before moving on to the next phase. Uh, I suspect this is coming. I would guess it would have to come to the FCC. And of course, we have a whole new leadership team at the FCC. They have to get their selves organized. Um, but I would hope we would see uh, work done on spoofing of phone numbers, um, you know, within a year or so coming out of the FCC once the new folks get there, get, you know, kind of get themselves organized. Um, I don't believe the 5% growth to research would apply to the DOD. Um, I'd have to go back and check that, but I'm pretty sure that they're not included. The problem is the DOD research is so big that it just messes up the numbers for everybody else. NIH is the same way, but NIH is included. DOD is also not typically seen as a research agency. It, of course, obviously is. It is by far the largest research agency, but the purpose of DOD is not research. The purpose of the NSF, National Science Foundation, is research. The purpose of NIST is research and a few other things. DOD isn't. So I don't believe the DOD research is included in that. Keith, I think you already registered for the CBD. In case you haven't, please do so, though. All right, I don't see any other questions. Just making sure. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you all enjoy your spring whenever it arrives, wherever you are. Spring is about to hit us pretty hard here in D.C. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Mr. Rosencrantz just emailed saying, are there any states that need more representation in CVD? Um, more is always better. Uh, I can tell you we have a huge team from California, which is fantastic. We're hitting like 16 or 17 congressional districts. Um, off the top of my head, the, I'll tell you, the one state that we don't have anybody from that I would love to get somebody from is South Dakota. Senator Thune is an important voice on science in the Senate. Uh, and I know we have a, a, a couple good sections up in South Dakota with a lot of active members. Uh, and it would be fantastic to get some people from there. Uh, I could use a couple extra people from Maine uh, and North Carolina. But again, if you're not in one of those states, we need you to participate too, because in politics, more is always better. Good question, though. And with that, 
Uh, have a great afternoon. I'm Russ Harrison, the Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA in Washington, D.C. My phone number is 202-530-8326. My email address is r.t.harrison at IEEE.org. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to talking with you again on April 2nd. Have a great afternoon. I had the coolest job that any electrical engineer could ever have on the ground crew for Solar Impulse 2, the first solar-powered airplane to fly around the world only using the power of the sun. IEEE USA has given me a competitive edge because of their support system. It is so much easier doing something and being out of your comfort zone when you have someone there saying, you got this. IEEE USA is more than just a network. It's a family.